Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Today's podcast is on how to identify problems, develop goals, objectives, and interventions. In social work, we often refer to the document that contains the problem statement, goals, objectives, and interventions as the treatment plan or service plan. At its best, the treatment plan is a roadmap that outlines how the client and the social worker will travel from point A to point F. Point A can be thought of as the issues, concerns, or problems that were identified through the assessment and diagnosis. Point F is what the client's life will look like when those issues have been successfully addressed. Now, I intentionally used point F as the end point because it's unrealistic to assume that the problems our clients come in with can be resolved in a linear fashion. So rather than thinking, oh, the client and I will develop a treatment plan, we'll follow it, and then we'll be done, it's more realistic to think we're going to develop the best plan we can, and when life derails our plan, we're going to revisit and revise. When you find yourself traveling through points B, C, D, and E, don't get discouraged. Just remember that they're all parts of the journey. Today we're going to talk about how to frame the vast amounts of information that a client presents into a workable problem. We'll discuss the difference between goals and objectives and how to develop useful and achievable goals and objectives. We'll talk about what types of interventions or strategies are typically used to achieve the goals that you and your client set. And then we'll end with a comparison of a poorly conceived and an appropriately conceived treatment plan. Some of the resources I consulted um, as I was making up this podcast were Donald Weiger's Clinical Documentation Primer and Sourcebook, both available through Wiley Press, uh, Dr. Lambert McGuire's Clinical Social Work, available from Brooks Cole, and Hepworth Rooney and Larson's Direct Social Work Practice from Wadsworth Thompson. Imagine that you're a social worker in an outpatient community mental health agency. Your newest client is a woman. We'll call her Tammy. And she's in her mid-50s, and she presents with depressed mood. She's soft-spoken. She has an engaging smile and reports enjoying daytime soaps and movies starring Will Smith. Her housing is safe and accessible, and she reports having faith in something but she's not sure exactly what that something is. During your assessment, you learn that she's been sober for six years, but reported a 15-year addiction to crystal meth. She reports a history of sexual abuse, both as a child and as an adult, including multiple rapes during the time that she prostituted herself for drugs. She also reports a history of physical abuse towards others, including her three children, each of whom spent time in foster care. She reports having no social supports and no living relatives, including her children, with whom she's in contact. Her physical health is poor as she's suffering the effects of post-polio syndrome, resulting in the loss of the use of her legs and the progressive loss of the use of her arms. As you listen to Tammy's story, you might find yourself feeling overwhelmed and think to yourself, well, how could I possibly help her? If you are feeling overwhelmed then it's possible that you're tapping into the experience that that Tammy herself is having. Most of our clients come in with a lifetime of problems, as well as a lifetime of solutions. And it's our job to help our clients focus on what is most important to address in this moment. Milton Erickson, the famous hypnotherapist, was once asked how he was so successful at treating patients that others had no success in helping. He answered, When people come into my office... They often come in with problems they can't solve. What I do is I make sure that they leave with problems they can solve. So the first step in any helping process is to identify what the solvable problem is. Regardless of your theoretical perspective, there are a few questions that you need to have answered in order to help your client. The first is to find out why is your client seeking help and why is she seeking help now? 
What problem or problems would she like to resolve? You'll also want to have some idea of what you'll do in therapy and what your client will do outside of therapy to address these problems. Next, you'll want to figure out how you and your client will know if the treatment is working. And finally, what will let you know that therapy is no longer necessary? How will you know when it's time to terminate or transition into another treatment? If you can answer all of these questions, then you've gone a long way towards developing a sound treatment plan. Problem definition. Defining a problem can be challenging, but the good news is that once you've defined the problem, then you've suggested a solution. For example, if one of Tammy's problems is feeling worthless, specifically that she's not important to anyone, then the solution is to help her see that she is important to someone. Feeling worthless is one of the symptoms of major depressive disorder. In many agencies, and for nearly all third-party reimbursement, and by third-party reimbursement I mean insurance, whether that be private or federal, uh, DSM diagnoses provide the basis for problem definition. However, the diagnosis itself is simply a category, a shorthand way of describing a cluster of symptoms, a level of impairment, and distress or disability caused by a symptom. And as a category, the diagnosis is insufficient as a description of a problem. If you want to learn more about DSM diagnosis or the biopsychosocial assessment, you can listen to the related podcasts that can be found on the socialworkpodcast.com website. So in Tammy's case, the problem is not major depressive disorder, and that, that's, that's just too vague. A more specific description of the problem is that she believes that her life is worthless. This is obviously not the only problem in Tammy's life, but it is the one that we can work on. Once we have identified the problem, we can come up with the goals and objectives that will help us to achieve our solutions. Donald Weiger writes that goals are long-term, general, and are often the opposite of the problem. In Tammy's case, if the problem is that she feels worthless, then the goal is to help her feel important to something or someone. Can you see how by flipping around the problem, we take a seemingly overwhelming situation and make it a little bit more manageable? Manageable doesn't mean easy or quick, but it does mean that the problem is a little closer to being solved. If you're in an agency that bases treatment and reimbursement on the DSM, then you want to make sure that you've listed goals and objectives for each symptom of the diagnosis. If you find yourself getting stuck figuring out what a goal should be, just remember that the most basic goal for your client is to be able to function at whatever level they were functioning at before the current problem started. Weiger refers to that as pre-morbid functioning. The specific steps we take to achieve the goal are called objectives. Objectives are short-term and specify who does the action, for how long, and how often to achieve the desired outcome. Hepworth, Rooney, and Larson suggest a simple formula for remembering the components needed for a clear objective. Their formula is to specify who will do what by when. The who is the individual responsible for accomplishing a task. And that might be the client or the therapist. It could be somebody in the client's social network or another professional, possibly a referral. The what refers to the tasks that the individual needs to complete in order to achieve the goal. And the when sets a time limit. And the time limit can be really useful because it adds a sense of urgency as well as an endpoint. For example, during your assessment with Tammy, you found out that the last time she felt important to someone or something was before she lost the use of her legs. She reported that she would go out with her friends and meet them for dinner 
twice a week. Since she has been in a wheelchair, she doesn't drive because she can't afford a modified car. And because her friends didn't really follow up with her once she lost her ability to meet them for dinner, she believes that she's lost those friendships and that her friends no longer accept her in her disabled state. So at the moment, Tammy feels worthless, and she doesn't even feel important to anybody. And she's not going out. She's not meeting her friends. So an objective might be to meet friends for dinner, which is zero times a week now. And the objective would be to meet friends for dinner two times a week, sometime in the next three months. Notice how the objective has a baseline, zero times per week, as well as a target, two times a week, and a time frame that it'll happen within the next three months. It also has a who, Tammy, a what, meeting friends for dinner, and a when, within the next three months. Because the goals and objectives derive from the assessment, you don't have to make up these numbers out of thin air. You just have to find out what Tammy's life was like before this problem started and then work backwards. If she's able to increase her social outings to two times a week, you've helped her return to what Weiger calls her pre-morbid functioning or her level of functioning before this problem started. If you're thinking to yourself, well, okay, but there are steps that she would need to take in order to meet her friends two times a week, then you're starting to get the hang of this. The more realistic and more precise you can be in your objectives and the objectives to meet the objectives, then the more successful you and your client will be at solving whatever problem it is that they came in to resolve. You will feel a sense of professional pride and probably most importantly, your client's life will be more fulfilling. Interventions and Strategies Weiger writes that strategies are the means by which you will achieve your treatment goals. Lambert McGuire notes that each objective can have more than one intervention. Interventions are typically specific to whatever theoretical approach you take. For example, if you take a cognitive behavioral approach, you're more likely to use interventions such as identifying distorted thoughts. If, however, you use a solution-focused approach, you might use things like the miracle question and finding exceptions. Weiger has listed the following typical strategies. Type of therapy, that can include individual group, family, play, etc. Models of intervention, um, such as cognitive behavioral therapy or pharmacotherapy. Techniques, such as systematic desensitization, social skills training, etc. And homework assignments. For Tammy, our intervention might include individual therapy using interpersonal psychotherapy to address role transition from being able-bodied to a person with a disability. Uh, another intervention could be to refer Tammy to a post-polio syndrome support group where she could develop relationships with people in her same situation. Techniques might include grieving the loss of the old role and accepting her new role. And homework assignments can include journaling, investigating transportation options, etc. An intervention specific to the goals and objectives that we discussed earlier could be that I will do some role playing with Tammy to help her practice talking to her former friends or friends that she considers former friends and find out exactly what she would say and how she would say it so we can work through some of her anxiety or sense of hopelessness about reconnecting with these old friends. To sum up, the most important thing to remember about setting goals, objectives, and interventions is that they derive from the assessment and they result in the client returning to their pre-morbid functioning or even better. Your goals have to relate to the problem, otherwise your interventions won't result in a solution. If your goals are vague and your objectives are not measurable, then it's going to be very difficult for you to answer the questions that we talked about in the beginning, such as, how will I know if my interventions are working, and how will I know when treatment is no longer necessary? Imagine Tammy coming in and the problem would be identified as she's depressed, 
the goal would be to feel happier and the objectives weren't measurable. They could be things such as improve mood, which is fine, but we have no idea what improve mood looks like. And the inventor interventions could be anything that I'm used to doing, such as having her keep a journal, having her talk to people. Um, and the interventions might be fine, but they wouldn't be specifically related to what it was that we were doing in the therapy se session to solve her problems. And in the worst case scenario, she would leave and she would feel like therapy is a waste of my time. Not only am I alone, but the one thing that I went to to solve my problems couldn't even help me. That's how hopeless my situation is. So when you come up with specific goals and objectives and your interventions address the problems that your client came in with, there's this sense of success both for you and your clients and your clients overall objective to lead a happier, more fulfilling life is most likely to come true. So I'm Jonathan Singer. Thanks for being with me today for this episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode, visit our website at socialworkpodcast.com. If you have suggestions for future podcasts, please email me at jonathan at socialworkpodcast.com. And to all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you back here next time at the Social Work Podcast.